this year in particular, I think the, you know, the big focus on the tourism industry has been on risk crisis and recovery. Open a newspaper, watch a news report on television, look at your uh, handheld device, and you're going to see mentions of coronavirus. And over the last year in particular, here in Australia, uh, you know, bushfires in the early part of the year and, um, and coronavirus for the rest of the year. So we're very privileged today to have really one of the one of the leading lights of the tourism industry. We've got two two of the leading lights really because one of them a leading light in tourism academia and a leading light in the tourism industry. Uh, Felicia Mariani is the CEO of the Victorian Tourism Industry Council, uh, which is a very proactive organization which has really done a lot to promote the interest and in the professional professional networking within the tourism industry. Uh, I first met Felicia um, in 2011 when she was actually the head of ATEC, which is the Australian Tourism Export Council, which is actually that body which looks after the inbound tourism industry for all of Australia. Um, she's had a, an, an enormous role in developing and promoting uh, tourism in Victoria in particular. And also to our, our speaker who's going to be speaking with uh, Felicia is uh, Dr. Joanne Pike. Uh, she's for the director for the School of the Visitor Economy um, at Victoria University. And uh, also too, she is a Senior Research Fellow, Institute of Sustainable Industries and Livable Cities. Um, Joanne's been a very, very active member of, of the SIG for the last few years. She's, I've seen some of the fantastic work she's done in assessing bushfires in particular, um, and many other events. So she's been very a very active uh, academic uh, participant in the area of, of tourism risk and crisis. Um, later on, after this particular session, we will have the opportunity for SIG members to, to join us in, uh, in um, sharing some of the research and work that they've actually been doing because uh, it, it, this has been a huge year for tourism risk crisis and recovery. Anyway, enough from me. Uh, you did the, so it gives me great pleasure to uh, to ask Felicia Mariani to um, give her presentation, uh, navigating the road to tourism recovery. And uh, it's been a pretty bumpy road, I think we can all agree. So Felicia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, David. And uh, it's a pleasure to join all of you here today. Um, you are right, David, it's been a very bumpy road. And sadly, it doesn't look like it's going to get any easier anytime in the near future. So um, probably a really important session for us to be going through right now. Um, oh, doesn't want to move. There we go. Just um, by way of background, because uh, we were uh, probably conscious that some of you may or may not know who VTIC is. And VTIC is the acronym for the Victoria Tourism Industry Council, by the way. And um, just a few kind of key points there. I wanted to run through this uh, before we start into the presentation. We're actually the peak industry association that is dedicated to the issues and the priorities of the visitor economy here in Victoria. Um, we actually have over 2,000 members all across the state. And what is unusual about our industry council is that we represent the broadest cross-section of the industry. So while there are a lot of industry associations who I might add, we work very, very closely within everything that we do, they tend to be sectorally represented across whether it's accommodation or uh, touring or uh, potentially restaurant and caterers association, hospitality by way of uh, uh, another industry sector. We actually take in the breadth of the visitor economy across events, accommodation, attractions, tour and transport. Um, our destinations, our regional tourism boards across the state are part of our member composition. And we have a lot of people who provide tourism services. And that's where our work with the education sector, the TAFE industry, a lot of marketing bodies, uh, a lot of digital bodies that all work with us to try and assist the industry in improving their performance. We do engage very heavily with both Tourism Australia and with Visit Victoria, which is our state tourism body here. But these are the demand driving 
agency. So they work on the marketing and, and really driving visitation into the destination. Whereas what we do is actually a B2B thing that works closely with the industry to build their capability and capacity. Um, look, I think none of us, um, None of us have to be told that the last year has been absolutely horrific. And the pandemic was catastrophic for many tourism businesses, not just in Victoria, but right around the world. But I think it's really important to note that um, this didn't just happen to tourism in March. Our issues, our dilemmas actually started back in it was New Year's Eve. I uh, remember I got the phone call in December 2019 with the start of the bushfire season. So. Um, right throughout January, our industry was smashed, um, losing their peak season in the start of 2020. Many of those bushfires, even though they, they occurred in a certain, um, a certain part of the state, it, was, it really affected the whole of the industry. And in, indeed, we saw that right across Australia again, where visitation was affected by consumers being concerned about bushfires. Uh, we also then got hit from the 28th of January when the Chinese government bound, uh, banned all outbound group travel from their country, which really adversely affected a lot of our Victorian operators who are so reliant on the Chinese market. And from the 1st of February, then our own government shut the borders to a range of countries that they perceived to be um, uh, at risk, if you will. And by mid-March, of course, the whole world was in a global shutdown. But I think by the time we got to that mid-March point, I think it's important to understand that the industry had already had three months of disruption and closure. And I think it's important to note at this point, um, our industry prior to the pandemic at the end of December, here in Victoria was worth $32.5 billion. Early estimates that occurred back in around April, May of last year estimated that we would lose $23.3 billion from our sector. And through the pandemic, we've been keeping track of things. And, and again, further estimates show that as a state, Victoria was actually hemorrhaging $2.5 billion per month by the lack of visitation coming into our state. Um, we're heavily reliant on visitation from overseas. And of course, the shutdown of international now until late next year has, or late this year, has really kind of decimated most of our industry. What we saw happening at that point very early on was there was, as you can imagine, a lot of fear, confusion and anxiety reigning across the industry. And we really felt as an industry association, we needed to grab a hold of this situation and to help the industry navigate, not just through the crisis, but we also wanted for VTIC to come to be seen as the single source of truth. We wanted to be the one-stop shop where people could come to find answers because what we were seeing was that the industry was already in quite an emotional state over what was happening. Our industry was, you know, as I said, shut down for many months by the time we actually really got to the worst of the pandemic. But they were also on information overload from the level of announcements coming out daily from both the state and federal government. Every time the prime minister stood up, every time the premier stood up, there was more information, new restrictions, new guidelines, but there were also um, you know, a plethora of support programs, thankfully, great support programs that came out at the state and federal level. But for people to try and process all of this in the middle of the anxiety that they were feeling over what was happening in their businesses, it was impossible. So we felt that we really needed to do something to step in to help to, I guess, kind of translate, if you will, and to become that single source of truth in assisting the industry through what was a, a horrific time. We, again, kind of watching what was happening across the sector, we put together a bit of a, a plan or a proposal, if you will, that we put to government seeking support to be able to create and design a range of bespoke programs to address some of the needs of the industry. Um, while we, we wanted to do something for a period of a full year, we were able to at least get some portion of funding through a grant process to help us to develop programs over the six month period. So I wanna step through a little bit of some of the things that we did in that time that was truly by virtue of, of us being successful with the grant program because we never would have been able to deliver these programs without that support. Um, one of the things we saw was that the industry was really looking for a bit of a safe haven, a place where they could come together and share what they were going through. I have to say, as an industry, 
we're really bad at asking each other for help. It's kind of, we're always ready to help someone else, but when we get into that situation of needing help ourselves, it's a very difficult thing for people to ask or to admit that they need help. So one of the things that we did first and foremost, we really quickly pulled together, we um, conduct a series of policy committees. We had six sector groups that we would bring together. So we brought those sectors together across accommodation and events and tour and transport and attractions, et cetera, and gave them a bit of a safe forum to come together and talk about what they were experiencing, the things that they were feeling, share support with one another, share ideas with one another, but most importantly, to let people know that they weren't alone, that everyone was going through the same thing and feeling those same levels of, of anxiety. Uh, we also introduced what we called our VTIC Insight Series. And this was a way, again, that we kept the industry connected. Uh, we conducted 16 webinars in the period from April to November. And I'm pleased to say that through that period, we were probably averaging around 300, 250 to 300 people per session, which was really incredible, but also really showed the need and the desire for that level of connection and that level of need of help in, in, in sort of navigating all the complexities that they were confronting. Um, I talked about the information overload at the state and federal level. And what we did, and I would encourage after you get off the, um, the webinar today, go and have a look on our website. We created the VTIC Industry Support Hub. And in designing this, as I said, we had this kind of overarching goal to become that single source of truth, a bit of a one-stop shop for all things related to COVID updates, support that was out there, grant programs, government regulation, restrictions, guidelines, all of the stuff basically trying to find a way to turn it into English and to help the industry understand how to digest it, but most importantly, how to implement it. Um, we also created 56 CEO and business updates over that same period. And again, pleased to say we actually achieved a 40% open rate. And one of the things that we did come to hear, which made us feel really, I guess, satisfied to think that we achieved what we set out to do. And people came back to us telling us that, you know, we just waited for your updates to come out or we went on to your, you know, hub to find out because we actually understood what you were trying to say. Rather than listen to all the things that they were being bombarded with, they waited for us to actually dissect that into something that they could they could actually understand and do something with. So we did become that go-to resource and we did become, I guess, if you will, the, um, I keep using the word translation because that's what comes back to me. But people really needed that. They needed us to turn the jargon into something that they could understand and that they could then do something with, particularly because many were so concerned about their own staff through this period as well. It wasn't just about them and their businesses, but how do I look after my staff? And I know that um, Joe's going to talk in a little bit about some of the um, I guess the mental health and well-being issues that have evolved and that's come through in the research that BU has undertaken as well. Um, this just gives you an example. Um, again, I'd, I'd invite you to go on to our, our VTIC website. You'll find, you can just Google VTIC Industry Support Hub and it will in fact come up. Effie, I think I did send you the link to that. You might just put that into the chat just to make it I'm easy for people. That. Great, thanks Effie. But you can see what we did was we, we actually translated all of the information that was coming out into how it was pertinent for the different sectors of our industry. And this became something really useful because a lot of times there were things about, for instance, the accommodation sector or the food and beverage sector that didn't necessarily apply to the attractions of the events sector. So we were able to really kind of customize the information and make sure that as a, as a particular sector, they were very clear on their obligations and responsibilities. So this has actually been a tremendous resource and one that, you know, obviously because we're not out of the woods yet will continue to be posting information up and putting resources on there for support and assistance to the industry. Um, we also conducted, these were probably, the tourism recovery consultations were probably, I think, one of the most successful pieces of support that we provided. One of the things that we saw through a lot of our consultation was that there were general business support programs that were being implemented through government, which were terrific, and they helped with the basic day-to-day -day operations of running a business. 
but no one understood the nuances of what the tourism industry needed. No one understood about our distribution channels. No one understood about the digital way that we had to try and connect with our consumers in new ways. They didn't understand about our you know, costs of distribution, our commission structures. So all of these questions that people had could not be answered through those general business consultation services that were available. So we actually put together a program of free 90 minute sessions with the experienced tourism industry consultants. And I think that was the difference. These were people who have lived and breathed our industry and the issues and problems that are inherent in it. And from the period from September to November, we conducted 126 consultation sessions within industry. 97% of those participants have rated that as either excellent or very good. Many of them have gone back and have actually started working with some of these consultants separately. But most importantly, it really helped people in reimagining their product, people who might have been reliant on international who needed to pivot to a domestic audience. These people really helped them to rethink their business proposition and hopefully set them on a path for recovery. We also uh, introduced the Victorian Tourism Digital Bizkeeper program that we did in conjunction with um, Tourism Tribe. Tourism Tribe has a great reputation of working with the tourism sector specifically to help them on you know, making sure that they've got the best possible connections and maximizing opportunities in the digital space and using technology to the benefit of their organization and their company. Uh, we ran a range of interactive courses that were designed specifically, again, for tourism operators, not just general business, but specifically looking at the needs and issues of tourism operators in distributing their products globally. And that program was actually open to 50 businesses, but sadly was very much oversubscribed, but of course we could only do what we could do with the resources that we had available. So we are looking at how we continue some of these programs into the future because clearly we are seeing that there is a, a need for this. And I guess that leads to my next slide here that all of this really has shown without a doubt, there is an enormous need in Victoria for strong industry development programs, but industry development programs that are constructed and delivered by industry for industry. And I think that's made a huge difference in the success levels that we've achieved with some of the interventions that I've just talked about here. One of the things that we did as, as industry, working with industry, we collaborated with Victoria University as we do on many programs in particular with their School of the Visitor Economy. Um, and we looked at a dedicated research project to try and understand and quantify, if you will, um, the depth and the dimension of what the industry had gone through, but also to find ways to measure and understand resilience and what operators were actually proving to be more resilient than others and what were those qualities that underpinned their ability to recover. So I might just draw breath there, and it is my pleasure mm -hmm. to introduce to you now Dr. Joanne Pike, the Executive Director of the EU School for the Visitor Economy, to outline their findings. Thanks, Jo. Okay, thanks, Felicia, and hello to everybody. Um, just to start, I've had the pleasure of working very closely with Felicia over the past few years. Um, and particularly intensely in the last year. So um, I just want to congratulate Felicia on her work as an industry leader and advocate for the industry. Um, her work has been tireless and um, uh, the industry owes her a great um, uh, debt for her um, incredible work that continues. So um, it was a pleasure and honour to collaborate with BTIC on this um, particular piece of research. Um, and I just want to give you a quick overview of some of the key findings um, uh, that will soon be made public. And um, I'll give you the details of that when um, you can get the report when it's available. Um, so um, the project was funded by Victoria University through our Planetary Health Strategic Program. And we argued for the project to, um, because of the importance of the industry in supporting local economies um, and um, the need to support industry transformation as we, um, as we move into recovery so that, um, because we're not coming out of this the same as um, as we were in 2019. So um, very briefly, the aim was to um, 
investigate and quantify the impacts of bushfire and the pandemic over the year, um, to analyze the vulnerabilities and resilience characteristics of the industry, um, and with the purpose to inform recovery planning going forward. Um, we used a destination sustainability framework that we've used elsewhere um, in bushfire affected communities, but also in the Pacific. Um, uh, we use secondary data, a statewide survey, um, and two destination case studies that were had variously impacted by both bushfire and the pandemic. And that was Bright, um, a town in northeastern Victoria that was um, directly impacted by bushfire. Um, and Echuca, uh, which is two and a half hours drive from Melbourne um, on the Murray River, and it's a twin town with Moama in New South Wales. Um, the study was undertaken by a team, very much so, um, that included uh, people from VU and from um, VTIC. Um, and what I just wanted to go over was uh, just briefly look at what we found in relation to impacts, um, industry characteristics that support recovery, um, vulnerabilities, and what some of the key implications I think are of the study. Thanks, Felicia. Um, okay. Just a moment. Okay, so um, this slide just shows some of the sort of headline findings um, in relation to impact. Um, so first of all, 60% of the industry said that they've been impacted by bushfire, which is interesting given that only 15% of the state was directly impacted by bushfire. So as um, Felicia was saying, um, the effects of smoke and changes to visitor behaviour over that summer um, had a really widespread effect on, on industry. Um, due to the pandemic, um, Almost all of the industry has had to close at least once over the past 12 months. Um, many businesses have lost all of their projected earnings for the year and the, um, the majority have lost more than 75% uh, of their earnings. Um, JobKeeper has been accessed by most of the industry and that's uh, kept the, many businesses afloat and um, widely regarded as a, a lifesaver. Um, there's been major impacts on staff. Um, uh, we rely heavily on casual staff and um, roughly half of casual staff have been let go or um, permanently or furloughed um, over last year. So a real concern for industry is um, about how to attract those staff back um, and retain those staff and uh, because the implication is that they will need to retrain as they reopen and they don't need additional stress. Um, one of the interesting findings is that, is that we used a scale uh, from the World Health Organization to me uh, measure well-being. Um, and what we find, found was that 45% were concerned about their mental health and um, almost as many concerned about their staff. But what we found was that the average levels of well-being was very low um, at levels where it would be recommended that you would receive treatment for depression. So um, it's not a happy industry um, and um, it's going to be a problem as the industry tries to recover. Um, the next slide, uh, Felicia. Um, so this is just a few of the findings in relation to um, uh, factors associated with recovery. So we, we use scales to measure um, adaptive and planned resilience. Um, confidence about business recovery, as well as um, a measure about well-being. So we found some interesting correlations. Um, the first is that there's a, a there was a significant correlation between those businesses who'd undertaken some kind of um, quality accreditation program, um, most particularly the program that's delivered by VTIC, but there are others, uh, but they were much more likely to anticipate being more likely to recover and recover more quickly than those who hadn't had that accreditation. Um, collaboration with industry bodies and associations um, uh, was correlated with adaptive and planned resilience. Um, and this is where um, the role of VTIC in, in all of that kind of um, connection and networking um, and industry support became very clear. Um, also connectedness with local community and other tourism operators had a positive correlation with planned and adaptive resilience as well. 
Um, businesses that had risk management plans had higher wellbeing scores. Um, and those who'd had experience with crisis in the past, um, and this came through quite um, experience in coping with bushfire, and because of this, uh, many of the industry have been directly involved in emergency management and recovery planning, and the systems have been refined. So that was, um, well, the pandemic was a different kind of shock. Um, they were better placed than other regions to address it. <clears throat> Smaller and younger businesses predicted faster, faster business recovery. So that was kind of interesting that those who'd been in the industry for a long time perhaps hadn't invested as much in their dis digital capacity or were perhaps not as um, able to innovate or pivot as quickly as others. Um, but leadership was also a really big factor uh, at the destination level, at the community level and the business level. Um, and they were all shown to be um, closely associated with resilience and recovery. So um, those are just a few of the factors that I think that um, they give us some guidance for um, recovery planning. Moving on to vulnerabilities, um, I think um, one of the biggest things, and, and um, Felicia spoke to this, was um, poor government understanding of the diversity and nature of the, of the tourism industry. Um, rightly or wrongly, the rules around the pandemic have been inconsistent, unclear and often illogical um, in many cases. So, and similarly support strategies to industry have been very hit and miss. Um, and this is in this case, because the pandemic is controlled by the Department of Human Services, um, which has, doesn't have a good understanding of the industry. And there are a, a few means of industry communication. Um, so much could be done going forward that would lessen the impact on industry without compromising public health, I believe. But um, uh, that's been a really big problem for the industry. Um, Cross-border communities are really have been really affected. Um, uh, our case study in Echuca just showed this, and there was no recognition of how two towns on each side of the river, each side of state borders, um, function as a whole, um, and they've been deeply affected, um, as have other communities across along the Murray River. Um, skills and workforce shortages is um, a vulner vulnerability going forward. Um, uh, particularly given our reliance on temporary labour, backpackers and international students. Um, now many students, many staff have moved on or been re-employed in other industries. So that's a fear of employers about how to attract and train new staff going forward. <clears throat> Um, low levels of risk management, um, roughly a third of respondents had no risk management plans. Um, the other related vulnerability is the um, incredible increases in the cost of business insurance in areas like Bright, which are exposed to bushfire. Business insurance has um, uh, increased 400%, making it un un unaffordable for for many industries. Um, what this means in terms of future crises um, I, I just don't like to think because it really adds to the vulnerability of our industry. Um, and, you know, th that relates to um, a, a loss of capital for infrastructure improvements. Um, uh, this is was really highlighted in our Achuka case study where they've worked really hard in the last, as they say, the last 10 years to move from being a three-star destination to a four-star destination. Um, now businesses are saying they're just not going to be able to make improvements going going forward. So, um, and, you know, it, the, the scenario doesn't look good for the next four or five years, really, given the losses that they've suffered. Um, the industry is physically, emotionally, and financially exhausted. Um, and as uh, Felicia pointed out, the industry is not good at asking for help. This is particularly the case in regional Victoria who pride themselves on um, being very stoic and independent. Um, given that characteristic and sort of thin mental health services on the ground, um, people accessing the help that they need is, is a challenge going forward. So that's just a few. And I think altogether, all there's a lot of implications. I mean, I think, I mean, the first one is um, quite obvious that Victoria's been significantly more affected by crises than, than other states. Um, it needs additional support. Um, it's been going on for a long time and we're in lockdown again. <clears throat> so, um, uh, 
we're battered and bruised um, in ways that other states um, haven't been. Um, I think the other really important thing about the study is that um, what the crisis has done is expose a number of cracks um, that were in the industry before, we knew about them, but these have been widened um, by the crisis and um, the imperative to act on those, um, those, those cracks hasn't been strong enough when everything was growing. So um, uh, I think that we really need to do a, um, a lot about the, the, those long-term issues that we, um, we've, we've known about for some time. I've mentioned that recovery will be delayed due to the, the depleted financial and social, social capital. And when I talk about social capital, one of the cracks that's been revealed is um, in some areas, some regional areas, um, we've seen a growth of anti-tourism um, sentiment uh, and more divided communities in some instances um, due to concerns about visitors bringing um, uh, risky um, uh, public health. Um, on the industry development theme, I think that we need um, uh, real attention to um, skills and workforce capabilities, digital capability, innovation, infrastructure development, risk management, and so on. Um, but I think most importantly um, in Victoria, um, destination planning um, is really needed in order to go forward. We don't actually have a um, state um, visitor economy plan um, at the moment at all um, and everything's changed so that's a that's an urgent priority um, because I think that where we do have destination plans um, uh, they're off they fail to promote collaboration across regions and across state borders and we're really going to be needing to work together to grow the whole pie um, rather than competing against each other um, so, you know, that's, that's what I think is the highlights from the research. Um, we've got many challenges and um, I'll hand back to Felicia, um, perhaps to um, make some final comments. Thank you, Jo. Um, I think that last slide, which I might just go back to, because I think it's a really good slide around the importance of good destination planning. And we were talking about this a bit in, uh, you know, in some of our sort of preparation time. If you take a look at the moment, um, both Destination New South Wales and um, Tourism South Australia have actually uh, launched their visitor economy strategies to 2030. Um, we've done quite a lot of work here in Victoria, a lot of background work, but we still actually don't have a current plan that's, that's out there. And that's probably the key thing that as an industry, I think everyone is really hanging out for. Having said that, I think that it's imperative on Victoria to really use this, we're at a crossroads right now. And I think people are prepared to do bolder things than probably they would have done before. You know, we are back to ground zero. So, you know, there's a, there's a really big question that we are asking ourselves right now. And that is, what do we want Victoria to be famous for? And that's all the conversations that we're having um, with government colleagues who are, um, you know, in this whole space of destination planning is redefining what does Victoria want to be famous for? You know, 20, almost 30 years ago now, we wrote the whole strategy around using major events to attract visitation. We wrote the strategy around the role of great food and wine in attracting visitation. We wrote the strategy on touring around the state to disperse visitors to other parts of our regional areas. The problem is over the last 20 years, everybody's copied from that rule book. So how do we as Victoria redefine what we want to be famous for? How do we reinvent what tourism stands for in this state, but indeed across Australia, because that's what that's what we do. And I guess right now, everyone is looking for those really bold decisions about how we're going to take Victoria forward after such a horrific year that we've all lived through. So we might just pause there because I know we're very keen to take some questions. So if it's okay to the moderators, we might open the floor to the questions. I'll stop sharing my screen, which might make that a bit easier to read. Thanks, Felicia. So um, are there any questions? Please feel free to uh, pop it in the Q&A on your screen. Um, 
while people are thinking about it, I may, I may if I, I may actually Go take ahead. it. Ask ask a question while people are thinking about it, and this can be for for both Felicia and for and for Joe. <clears throat> One of the things that's been really interesting, particularly in Victoria, has been the disconnect between, and lack of understanding of of government and tourism industry needs and tourism industry priorities. The same as you pointed out also in your talk, Felicia, the the health. Um, bureaucracy doesn't also really necessarily have a very close understanding. So I'm just wondering, I guess my question is, how can, how can that gap be best bridged, as you yeah, said? That's, David, that is such a good question. And it's, it's one I wish I had a really solid answer for because I would have implemented it about nine months ago. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but um, look, there's a really interesting article um, that I just read, I was saying to the guys, I just actually posted it up on um, LinkedIn over the weekend. It was written by actually the CEO of Virtuoso, which is based in the United States. So there was a side of me that was actually quite relieved to hear that this wasn't just a problem for us here in Australia. But what he was talking about was exactly the same thing. And the title of the article is that, you know, the biggest problem for tourism is not the pandemic. It's actually the fact that government doesn't really understand how tourism works. Yeah. And one of the things that he talked about, um, and again, this is what gave me some comfort in seeing it wasn't just here in Australia, but tourism is not a line item on the ABS you know, chart of accounts. You can't go to that, that list and find tourism. You can find accommodation, you can find food service, you can find um, transport, but that's only a very small part of our industry. And this is fundamentally the problem is that the diversification of our industry and the complex nature of our industry means that we are easily misrepresented by people who are developing government policy. We are easily seen to be not too big to fail. And, and that's what they look at, those industries that are too big to fail. But the reality is when you actually combine all the aspects of our industry, we are incredibly important. And I think the thing that we forget about, Joe mentioned this around the, the employment and the not just the economic fabric, but the cultural and social fabric of regional communities that are so reliant on tourism. You know, the one, I guess the one shining light that's come out of the pandemic is that all of these regional areas who, and, and many people here in the city as well, who didn't really perceive themselves to be as in tourism, quickly learned how reliant they are on the tourism industry to deliver their business. You know, this was not just the accommodation sector and the attractions that were hurting, but the butcher, the baker and the candlestick maker in every single regional town felt the impact of the loss of visitation starting with the bushfires. So it has actually helped to elevate the importance of our role in the minds of people in many regional communities but we have not solved the problem of how we help government understand the nuances and the connectivity of tourism to so many other aspects of our economy. Mm. Can I just add to that, David, as well? And I couldn't agree sure. more with um, Felicia, but I think um, there's some real lessons we can learn too from um, fire management. Um, I've seen over the last six years, since the Harrietville fires in 2013, um, the, they was, that town and that region was saying exactly the same things about um, um, fire management as not understanding the visitor economy um, and implementing measures unnecessarily that um, impacted them. We did a comparison of the handling of the fires in the Otway Ranges of 2016. Emergency Victoria had learned those lessons and it was handled so much better. The impact was lessened considerably by um, engaging with industry, better stakeholder communications, better media messaging. Um, there was a whole lot of lessons learned and applied. And I think that we can um, uh, build on that, those learnings as well. Thanks for that, Joe. There is a, a question from Brent. Um, <clears throat> Brent is seeking views uh, on because data and evidence is crucial to collect, and Felicia is right, we are at a disadvantage here. 
In the UK, the Office of National Statistics have collected data on tourism and hospitality. Um, where is the um, ABS or TRA in helping providing this data? Any interaction with these agencies from the industry councils? Um, well, TRA, I think, is front and centre in all of this, but Tourism Research Australia does an awful lot of work in this space and really does provide us with most, most of our statistics. I have to say, and David, you'll remember this, talking about my days back in ATEC, because that's when this happened, around 2011-12, ABS actually used to conduct, um, there was a survey of small tourist accommodation that was actually conducted across the country. It was done on a quarterly basis, which really helped to inform a lot around investment, helped people to make decisions around where across Australia that they might invest. But it also played a huge role for the aviation sector in determining a lot of where they were gonna point new aircraft or where they might decide they wanted to actually implement some new services. Now that went from four times a year down to twice a year. And I think by about 2012, they canned it completely, all in the name of saving money. So our ability to actually really gather useful data cannot all sit with Tourism Research Australia. There needs to be other resources that are out there to be able to draw on, as I say, that kind of broad cross-section of influence that we have across so many other industries. But we, again, we just don't get that traction when we need to get it. Yeah. So we do continue. We've been banging on about this since the day that it was, was given up. I mean, it was a huge issue that they gave up this, um, this survey of, of tourist accommodation across the country. But, you know, how many years ago was that now? Nine years ago? And we've gotten nowhere with it. Uh, I know to, uh, to, uh, TTF Tourism and Transport Forum has been mm -hmm. one source of information, but it's usually mm -hmm. something that... Uh, that you have to pay fairly heavily for, if I'm not mistaken. Um, thank you for that. There is another question uh, from Brent again, Brent Ritchie from uh, Queensland. Uh, work, workforce shortages also mentioned by Daniel G from um, QTRC. Some operators have major shortages and, and then we have staff being made redundant in, all the, in other areas need some way of matching needs with labour and perhaps some retraining is needed. What are your views on how this can be done? Now, why don't you take that one? Because I know that's right up your alley with the skills and workforce planning. <laughs> well, um, I think that the skills and labour shortages is a really big, complex complex problem um, to do with um, the status of the industry, um, employment conditions, um, um, over reliance on temporary labour and so on and so forth, and I can, I think, and the other issue that's really um, coming up though is for our regional areas in particular, um, is that um, where in highly visited areas housing is becoming un unaffordable, and it's got much worse during um, mm -hmm. uh, the COVID. Um, COVID lockdowns because of tree changes. People who've had holiday, and I'm thinking of Bright here because it was a really good example of it. People who owned holiday houses in Bright have moved out of Melbourne and, and they're living in their holiday houses. So um, the stock of rental uh, uh, capital uh, uh, housing has, has gone down. Um, anything that is available um, uh, it costs a bomb um, and any affordable accommodation is an hour's drive away. Um, so for temporary seasonal work, um, it's going to be really hard to attract um, workers going going forward. So I think we're going to have to have some really creative solutions to that. Um, in the, and, and it will be regional. We'll have to look at each region. So in the northeast, we're going to have to look at sus sustainable jobs. And that might mean linking up the ski fields with the cycling fields with the food and wine industry so that um, in we can pull employees, um, manage some affordable housing and so on. But um, uh, I'm not sure that that answers um, Brent's complete question. But, um, but I think, first of all, we need to examine it more, more closely um, and use some consistent f um, uh, skills frameworks and also recognise that we're competing in an international market for talent as well. You know, the whole Asia Pacific region is recruiting chefs from overseas, for example. Yeah. 
you know. Um, so we're not just operating in Victoria, uh, state in our own state or nationally, we're operating internationally for, for, and competing for skills. <clears throat> Thanks for that, Joe. Uh, are there any other questions? I have um, I have a question while people would like to pop a question. Um, and Felicia, you very rightly said about how Melbourne uh, was positioned over the years and we were positioned with major events, et cetera. <coughs> well, now, and as you said, we cannot look at having any major events for a long time. Mm -hmm. So what can we do to maintain the event reputation in the meantime? <laughs> Yeah, that's a, that's a tough question and one that's uh, really salient right now as the world's eyes are on us for the tennis open. And it's been, um, yeah, it's been unfortunate that we've had to go into a five day snap lockdown in the middle of the open um, because it's become, you know, very, pu very public uh, for this to happen. But I think there are some things and it's, it's interesting what you mentioned, Effie, because one of the one of the most challenging aspects of the events industry is again, the complex nature of events. And people do understand and do see events at that kind of major international hallmark level. So things like the, you know, the Australian Open, the Grand Prix, um, uh, the Spring Racing Carnival, people get those events, they understand how they operate, governments used to working with those events. And even though it's been a challenging, very challenging environment for the tennis this year, and Bless them for all they've done to get that event up because it's been a monumental task, um, regardless of what we're going through at the moment. But they've had a direct line into government and they've been able to work through, you know, things around quarantine issues with tennis players and crowd control, et cetera, et cetera. When you step down a notch below that and you've got the events and festivals that occur, whether they are in Melbourne, whether they are regional events, and then you've got the whole business event sector that sits beyond that. There is very little understanding of how those sectors work and they are not the level of events that have a direct contact into government. So it has been incredibly challenging for some of those events. And, and to be honest, they have not been able to reactivate. So while we've done a few things at that major hallmark level and we'll, you know, we'll continue to bubble along there, the plethora of events that sit below that, the regional events and festivals, our business events sector has been shut down since the middle of March. And there is no anticipation that business events will be able to reactivate before at least the middle or third quarter of this current year. Now that's 18 months roughly mm -hmm. of, a, of a sector that has been shut down. And recovery from that, how do you come back from that? And the, the scariest part as well is many of those suppliers to that event network. So people like Harry the Hirer who does all the infrastructure around those events. Um, Peter Jones, who's a you know, world famous PCO here in, in Australia that, that actually organizes these types of events. You've got sound artists, you've got lighting people, you've got entertainers, you've got food and beverage people, you've got uh, florists. There's a plethora of people that, that actually make these events come to life. Many of these people are sole traders. They don't keep big staff on, on deck because they contract staff and, and, and basically up and down, depending on what comes in. So they've not been able to access a lot of the state and federal programs. So you've, you've got businesses out there that are hanging on by a thread. And if we don't find a way to support that supplier network that supports the events industry, how does Victoria reactivate our events when we're ready to do that? So these are all the things that we're working through at the moment here and spending a lot of time working with our event sector to try and get to some answers and some conclusions exactly to your question around what's needed to support the industry to, to survive um, because it's going, to be, it's going to be many more months before they're back on their feet again. Thanks for that, Felicia. Uh, there's also another comment from Branch of how complex the issue is. CBD areas are hurting as corporate market, international visitors down, regions need more demand as domestic tourism has grown. And it's a really difficult one. Um, and in the short term, thinking of some matching is needed. People agree. Um, and then another comment from Sarah Jane Warren, if there are serious skills gaps and empty spaces, it is not an opportunistic time to use the buildings and engaging retrenched workers to upskill them. 
as a transition period for the recovery of tourism after the vaccine. So there's some really interesting mm. concepts going through the, the chat at the moment. Mm. Uh, seeing we have a little bit of time, if I may ask a question again of both Joe sure. and Felicia. Um, given the research that you did, Joe, uh, about the importance of JobKeeper, where do, where does and and I guess I'd ask this to to you, Felicia, from a policy point of view, where does does the VT, VTIC stand on the idea of extending JobKeeper, seeing that it's uh, based on your statistics, it's absolutely mm, vital. Yes. Um, David, one of the things that we're seeing, and I think we've all heard this time and time again, the mm. federal government is not open to the idea of extending JobKeeper. Yes, so I'm well aware of, the, of that. <laughs> one of the things we've decided is we needed to reframe the conversation. Yeah. Don't keep coming out and beating the dead horse and asking for an extension of JobKeeper when mm -hmm. clearly the roller door has shut down on that one in the federal government. So what is happening at a national level, and, and VTIC is a member of... Uh, a, a national body called ATIC, which is the Australian Tourism Industry Council, and there's one of me in every state. Um, Brent would know that um, quite well with Daniel Geschwind up in, in Queensland, but there's, a, there's a, an industry council in every state. So we've been working collectively across all the industry councils, and we have a national executive director that actually does a lot of our lobbying in Canberra on behalf of all of the, of the ticks. Um, I actually work very closely as well, David, you mentioned in TTF and um, Margie Osmond and I have been having a lot of conversations around what TTF is doing at a national level around this. And one of the things that we've discussed is the need to talk about a targeted package to save tourism. So this isn't about JobKeeper, don't even use that language. We've just talked about a targeted program of support to save tourism and to save jobs in tourism. And that's kind of the language that we've been using at that national level. Um, we are actually, that was one of the calls I had to take right before we got started because um, it is kind of storming and forming at the moment and, and we're getting very close to probably being able to take something to the federal government. But I think the good thing is that it is causing these conversations to happen. There is um, exchange going on between industry associations that probably in the, you know, in the good times wouldn't bother to talk to one another. But you know, it's really critical right now. This industry has got to get over its diversification. If we're gonna survive, we have to stop competing with each other. You know, my favorite expression is let's let's stop with the king of the kids stuff. We don't need that anymore. Yeah. What we actually need is everybody committed to a singular proposition so that we can't be batted away in Canberra, which is their favorite thing to do because everybody's got a different view. Everybody wants something different. We have got to come up with a few core base principles that the industry subscribes to and that everybody goes to Canberra. You can put other things around it. To, to kind of, you know, customise it for your sector. But we need three or four core principles that everybody's asking for. So government can't tell us that we're not speaking with one voice. And, and interestingly enough, to, to back up what you say, uh, AFTA made a great big deal about the fact that it managed to secure a special deal for travel for the travel agency sector. Mm -hmm. And yes, they certainly needed help, no argument about that. But I think the point that you're making uh, is something I've said in many, many publications, uh, industry publications, is that if the industry is going to speak, is going to be successful, the government has to speak with a single voice covering yeah. all sectors, not just one sector at a time. Yeah, so, that's, that's the yeah. difficulty. Yeah. Oh, um, thanks for that. I'm too. I'm just trying to move on to cover a couple more questions. Uh, we we have six more minutes left, and oh, okay. I, I hope we don't get cut off. In case that does happen, the conversation will continue in the next link, which is the um, ZIG members link. So please don't forget to join that one. I'd, I've got a question, and I hope, Sarah, um, your question was slightly covered about what training packages are, are put together. Um, uh, there is a question here from Colin. Has there been any thought about extending the recent Victoria Tourism 200 voucher rebate scheme for regional tourism to be extended to live events, music festivals, etc. Um, well, first of all, the two hundred dollar voucher—it's actually an, it's an expenditure voucher. You can use it on anything in regional Victoria. That's the that's the issue. 
Um, so essentially what you have to do is you have to spend $400 to get $200 back. Now, if you spend, you know, $100 on going to a regional festival um, and you've spent that money in the regional area, you can count that toward your expenditure of the $400. So you can actually use the voucher for, the idea is to spend money in regional Vic on a range of different things. So you have to show your receipts of what you've spent up to $400 in order to get 200 back. What we are actually arguing for at the moment is for that to be extended to Melbourne. There is absolutely no reason why Melbourne as the capital city should be excluded from the use of a $200 voucher when they are absolutely on their knees right now here in Melbourne. Our hotels here are operating at 25 to 30% occupancy levels. And if you net out the quarantine program, they're operating at about 15% occupancy level at a time when they should be seeing 90% occupancy level. So the need for having a voucher program to kind of, you know, push business along in Melbourne as well is really what we're arguing for. So not one or the other, but there's no reason why those voucher programs can't be extended all across the whole state, including the capital city. Uh, thank you for that. And Philly, uh, Sarah is also adding um, for those to be to have an angle on cultural tourism and revival just to build back better. Yeah, good point. Good point, Sarah. Thank you for that. So we've got a couple more minutes left. I would just like to hand back over to David just to close the session. Okay, well, firstly, could, could on behalf of all of us, I'd love to thank uh, Felicia and, and Joe for two very thought provoking um, and really graphic presentations. I thought they were actually fantastic. Um, I, I'm, it's a pity we didn't actually have more people listening, but even based on the questions that were asked by those who were here, uh, you obviously captured your audience incredibly well. And I, I know some of the people who are asking questions. So you had some, uh, you had a, a small but very high quality audience. So thank you very much for that. Um, you were both really, really wonderful. So on behalf of Corthy and especially this, the special interest group, we're uh, most grateful for you spending your time and sharing your expertise with us. Um, just a very, very quick thing about the session that's following. You'll have, you, you will actually need to um, go into the portal again and, uh, and register in there. Um, what we do encourage for the future session is for you to share some of your own research because uh, I'm going to give a tiny little bit of a story about my own book, but um, this, it's, it should be about learning what, uh, what everybody else is doing. But I think we've really found that that uh, that the work that um, the Victorian Tourism Ministry Council has done uh, has been a very very good example of how tourism associations actually should be working. I, I'm really grateful for the fact that you talked about the importance of much more collaboration, and I know, and the sources that you use from Caligari, because I've I've referred to that one as well too. Um, uh, collaboration is absolutely significant, particularly in, a, in probably the worst crisis that we've ever dealt with in our lifetime. So, yeah, again, thank you very, very much. Effie, thank you very much for, for uh, helping make this happen. It's really time, been fantastic. <laughs> thank yeah. you. And thanks for those of you who did tune in. So uh, I guess it's probably time for us, unless you've got something else to say, Effie, for... We uh, yes. please yes. join that next session and uh thank you so much felicia and joanne for and it was just wonderful to prepare with you this fantastic presentation and great insight i appreciate it yeah okay, okay. Thank you. thanks for having okay. us okay see you, see you. Bye. Bye. Cheers.